gratitude in the midst of trials. Let's turn to the book of Psalms, the 116th chapter this morning. The book of Psalms 116. Shall we all read verses 1 through 4 in a responsive manner? The book of Psalms, the 116th chapter. Please be attentive to the word of God. Please learn to read it loudly, clearly, and reverently. John 1, 1 tells me God is word. The word is God. And when we hold this Bible in our hands, when we read it, there needs to be an evoked potential of energy that needs to come out of us. This is God. This is not a novel. And when we read this book, we ought to be in awe. When we read those scriptures, our voices need to be raised aloud. If you go to temples, Jewish temples, uh, Islamic temples, when they read, you can hear them so loud. Believers who know the truth uh, and the living God cannot open their mouth. They have no energy. What is our problem? Where is our love for the Lord? Where is my gratitude? Let's read Psalms 116 verses 1 through 4, please. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. The sorrows of death come past me, and the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Loving Heavenly Father, God of all grace and truth, I come before your holy and living presence, acknowledging that I'm a sinner, unworthy, ungrateful, undeserving. Only by your grace do I stand before your children. Empty me, fill me with thy spirit and with thy word. Let thy word go forth this morning. Use me as a vessel that will bring honor unto thee. And you be glorified, thou alone. Let your spirit reign in our hearts this morning. May it move within our coldness. Stir us up this morning, Lord Jesus. The deadness that is within us may be evoked and resuscitated, and we may stand in awe of you this morning. You're a holy God, a consuming fire. Help us that we may sit here in reverence and worship you in spirit and in truth. As I offer this prayer with much thanksgiving, in the most worthy and precious name of my Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, amen. amen. The psalmist here doesn't say who, we don't know who the writer is. But he says, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, my petitions, my request. The Lord has heard my voice. Therefore, I will love him. How many this morning are sitting here and can easily raise their hand if we ask and say, yes, Lord has heard my voice? I'm sure all of us. Each of us has a story and are able to say to everyone else, Yes, Lord has heard my voice. He has heard my cry. And therefore, I will love him. That's the portion I want you to focus on. Are you loving the Lord because he heard your voice? Or are you just saying, Lord, thank you for loving me. Or thank you for hearing me. But not showing him that attitude of gratitude. In your trials, in your difficult situation, in the depths of sorrows, when the Lord heard your cries, are you able to say, Lord, I thank you for you have heard my voice? This morning, dear children of God, the psalmist is encouraging us as we sang that beautiful song of worship and also the Psalms 23 that we sang. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, leading me beside still waters, restoring my soul. He has restored your soul, your soul that was so far away from him, destined toward hell and destruction. You and I were worth nothing. But the Lord in his mercy, in his compassion, has restored your soul and my soul unto him. 
Are you not going to say thank you, Lord? Are you not going to say I love you, Lord, because you have heard my voice? You have restored my soul. My soul that was this far away from thee, in the wrong. Where is my heart this morning? I love you, Lord, because you have heard my voice and my supplications. The attentiveness of God's ears to my cry should make us love him more. You know, when children, when they're babies, when they're infants, those of us that have had children, when that baby cries, instantly our ears are tuned in. Ask any mother and father. Some of the fathers, maybe not, but the mothers for sure, right? The mothers for sure will be attentive to the cry of that child. They could be a mile away, but the minute that child cries, the ears of that mother perk up. They said, my child is crying. Let me run and see what's happening with my child. How much more is your Savior that loves you and gave his life for you listening to your cry? And in response, what is my attitude? The Lord hath heard my cry. What am I doing for him? The attentiveness of God's ears to our cry should cause us to love him more. Turn to Psalm 66, 19 and 20 really quick. Psalm 66, verses 19 and 20. If anybody gets it, they can read it out loud. Nineteen, But truly, God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me, dear beloved. What about us this morning? The psalmist here is saying, Lord, you're blessed. Blessed is your name. You have heard my prayer, my cries. Is my heart overflowing with love? What is my attitude during trials? Is my heart in the midst of that trial overflowing with love? Or is my heart saddened that I cannot even thank the Lord? Do I sit and just vegetate in life? Let's, let's think about where my heart is and where our heart is. Even in the depths of troubles, the psalmist recognized, going back to Psalms 116, in the depths of his troubles, he recognized the Lord's love and his faithfulness toward him. Look at verse 3. The sorrows of death come past me. In other, in other translations, if you have a... Who's up there? Can we put it into another translation? It says... And the pains of hell got hold. It entangled me, it says, in another verse, in another translation. What other translation do you have? Nothing? Okay. The sorrows of death, it encircled my life. Many times in the depths of my troubles. But the psalmist recognizes that God is still faithful. His heart is overflowing with love. This reminded me in verse 4 and 3 and 4 of the story of Jonah, which we'll look at in a moment. We all know that beautiful story. So, in the, so gratitude in the midst of trials that I'm enduring is my heart overflowing with love. And if you ask and be honest with yourself, we are not in love with the Lord. We do not love the Lord with all our heart. Isn't that why we see the empty chairs? The love of many in the end days will wax cold. It will be so easy for us to skip church. We can watch it online. We can listen to it later. We can perhaps sleep a little longer. We have to work. We have to cook. We have to entertain. A lot of things occupy our hearts and our minds. But that attitude a heart overflowing with love is not often within us. But the Lord wants us this morning to say, along with the psalmist, I love you, Lord, because you have heard my voice and my supplications. Then the second point is, 
We need to be persistent in our thankfulness as well as our praying to the Lord. Be persistent in that attitude of gratitude. We need to be persistent in thankful. That's why the psalmist 34, in 34 says, I will bless the Lord at? At what? He says it with at all times. When my health is the worst in life, if I'm able to open my mouth, I have to bless the Lord. When my bank balance is almost nothing, I have to thank the Lord. When my children may be giving me the biggest headaches of my life, I have to thank the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. A persistent attitude of thankfulness. How many of us can raise our hand honestly and say, Lord, I am always thankful to you. I am always grateful to you for what you have done. I will always love you with all my heart. Can we say that honestly? Some of us can and some of us can't. But we have to examine our lives this morning before we open our mouth and offer worship to the Lord. And the psalmist makes a commitment to continue in prayer as well. He knows the Lord is turning his ear to him. And us, as his children, God has heard and answered many of our prayers, even when we were faced with distress and sorrow, or we found persistent in those prayers. Quickly, an example. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run out of time. Quickly, an example is found in 2 Kings, in chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. I'll read it quickly, 2 Kings 20 verses 1 through 3. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart and have done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. Look at the persistence of Hezekiah, the king. His days, we looked at the Psalms in chapter 90, teach us to number our days this morning when we began the service. Moses is telling us to help us to remember or count our days. Hezekiah was given a declaration, a statement, your days are done, you're going to die. Imagine if you would, someone was able to give us that statement. If you were told that your life is about to end, what would be my feelings? There would be anger, guilt, fear. So many things would take hold of us. But here, what is Hezekiah doing? What do we see him doing? We see him, we see him turning his face to the wall. Perhaps he's looking at a wall where he thinks the Lord is perhaps there behind it. And he's praying to the Lord. And begging of the Lord, Lord, I beseech you, remember me. Remember what I have done for you, how I have walked in your ways. And then we see the last part of that verse 3, Hezekiah weeping sore. Do you think that weeping was only for two minutes? Somebody has told him, you're going to die. Your days are done. Do you think Hezekiah just went and said a five-minute prayer? How many people think he prayed for five minutes? I'm sure none of us. He would have been persistently in the presence of the Lord praying, Lord, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. Remember how I walked before you. Have mercy on me, Lord. He was found persistent in his prayer. And at the same time, I would bet you that he would have been thankful to the Lord. It is not stated here. But I'm sure he would have been thanking the Lord because he knew God was going to answer that prayer. And he knew that he had that confidence that God was going to extend his life. That's why he continues to be in his presence and saying, Lord, remember. And he's weeping sorely before the Lord, persistent in his prayer and thankfulness. Quick, another example is found in Luke 18, verse 1. Luke 18, verse 1, it tells us the Lord Jesus Christ himself is saying, and, and he spake a parable unto them, those that were there listening, to this end, to this, word, to this uh, thought, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Don't give up praying. Do not faint. Many of us are going through trials of all sorts. 
difficult situations of all sorts, one after the other. It, you don't have a break in life. Ask a few people here, they would tell you their stories of all the difficult situations, one after the other, that are taking hold of them. But if that person or those people would continue in prayer, not faint, many of us faint, we give up. Last night, Bessie and I were at our friend's house and we had to listen to some people's dif difficulties. Parents telling us of difficult situations of their children. And what could we tell them? Nothing but you need to pray. We encourage them with that word. We need to pray. And, you know, this is what this, this portion tells us in Luke chapter 18. And the story, I, I don't want to read it, but we know the story of this unjust judge. A judge that did not fear God nor regarded man in verse 2. And a widow in that same city that came to him repeatedly, persistently. She wouldn't give up. She knew that this judge was unjust. He wouldn't even listen to me. He's not going to hear my complaint, but she wouldn't give up. There's an example of persistence. Another example. He, she was persistent in, in this thought. And after a while, he knew within himself in verse 4, though I don't fear God, though I don't respect man, yet because this widow is troubling me, I will answer her. Because she's going to wear me out if she continues to come and, and trouble me in that verse, in verse 5. And the Lord says in verse 6, hear what the unjust judge said. And then in verse 7, look at the beautiful part God is telling. Shall not God... In, and I looked up another translation. And will not God bring justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will your Lord keep putting them off? That's what it says, though he bear long with the means. Will he keep putting them off? When Brother John is crying out for his needs, whatever his needs are. When, when Brother Albert is crying out, when I'm crying out, when different people are crying out for whatever their struggle are. Is my God an unjust God? Like this unjust judge? Absolutely not. He's a just and merciful God. And because we're constantly being persistent in prayer as well as thankfulness, he's going to hear it. And he says he will answer. Your heavenly father is able to answer. Isn't that what we saw in Psalms 116 verse 1? And then quickly, lastly, the last point. So a heart overflowing with love is what we saw the attentiveness of God's ear should cause us to love him more. And then a persistent attitude of gratitude or thankfulness and worship and prayer. Then lastly, gratitude in the midst of overwhelming distress and sorrow. That's why Psalmist says in 16, 116, going back to Psalms 116, the sorrows of death come past him. The pains of hell got hold upon him. He found nothing but trouble and sorrow. Then... When he was faced with so much calamities, believers, like not, nothing else that you and I would have faced, this psalmist faced so much more. Now go to the story of Jonah, which we don't have time to read, but we all know the story. The story of Jonah found in chapter 2 of Jonah. I don't know if there was another person in, this, in the scriptures that would have encountered so much fear. Of course, Daniel when he was thrown into the den of lions, could have been scared or would have been scared, I, I would guess. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would have been scared in the fiery furnace, for sure. The Egyptians, or I'm sorry, the Israelites would have been scared when Israel was surrounded by the Red Sea or you know, facing the Red Sea and the, the host of Pharaoh in the back and wilderness. They would have been scared. But I was telling my children this yesterday in family prayer. Imagine if you were, because we were talking about creation and whales and big fish and all these things, and the story of Jonah came into my life or into my heart. And I said, imagine being swallowed by this big fish. We don't know if it's a whale. It doesn't say it, but perhaps it's a whale or whatever it is. Imagine being swallowed and living in the dark belly of that fish, that great fish. Can we picture this? Imagine how cold he would have been. Water probably in the belly, juices of the, the fish in the belly. But God allowed nothing to touch him, right? We know that. He didn't come out with burns, doesn't say. And, and, and if you read that story of Jonah, 
I, I won't read it now, but he's saying the waves, the billows were all over him. Could you imagine this fish just having fun in the water as, as it was made to do? Diving, we see great whales and, you know, great white sharks, all these big fishes. They're just, they're like, they're just having so much fun in that water, so free, going up and down. They bounce up and they come in. This is, inside there is little Jonah having the roller coaster ride of his life. Right, Anna? Imagine in that belly, he's going like this, jumping like this inside. How scared would I be if I was Jonah? I would be scared beyond belief. But what does he do? I guess I have to look at it real quick. The book of Jonah, chapter 2. Jonah, chapter 2. We see he, when my, yeah, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came in unto thee. Okay, and then from verses 1 on, you can see pray, Jonah's praying. He cries in mine affliction unto the Lord. He heard me out of the belly of hell. He calls it the belly of hell, cried I, and the Lord heard him. For thou cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas. The floods come past me about the billows, all the billows and the waves passed over me. Imagine, he's inside this fish which is underwater and it could, we don't know what sea, what ocean he was in and I don't know what the deepest parts of the oceans are but there are hundreds and hundreds of feet of depth in an ocean, that I know. I don't know the exact um, number. But imagine being in such a depth inside this fish. And when the waters come past, it says in verse 5, they come past me about, even to my soul. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottom of the mountain. The earth with her bars was about me forever. Look at the description he wants you and I to understand. You're talking about in Psalms 116, the sorrows of hell, the sorrows of death, entangling your life. I don't think anybody, one of us, have encountered such a feeling of fear. I don't know if I have. I think maybe Immu, when he had that little experience of the plane coming down. We all know that. Perhaps that was a big fear factor in that moment. But most of us probably haven't encountered the fear description here. But out of the depths of the belly of the fish, he calls it the depths of hell. He cries out to the Lord, and who's listening? Who's listening? Anybody awake? God is listening. Isn't that what we saw in Psalms 116, verses 1 through 4? The sorrows of death come past me, and the pains of hell got hold of me. They entangled me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I beg you, deliver my soul. And then verse 8, he says, For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. We have that beautiful statement in a beautiful Malayalam song, and I'm sure in other languages. The Lord has prevented my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from falling. This is what your God and my God has done. This is the God that the psalmist is telling, I will love the Lord. Are you in love with this Lord? Do you love this Lord who has rescued you from the depths of hell? You and I were going there. When we did not know the Lord Jesus in our, as our own Savior, we were destined for sure to go to hell. But the Lord rescued me in the nick of time. In the right time, the scripture even says, he came in the nick of time, the right time, and rescued me right from hell. And if that's what he has done for you and I, where is my attitude? What is my attitude this morning? Is it overflowing with love? Am I able to say, Lord, you're holy, you're good, you're righteous, you're faithful, you're merciful, your love I cannot understand? Am I being persistent in my worship and prayer? Do I have an attitude of gratitude or thankfulness 
in the midst of overwhelming sorrow, of overwhelming distress. May the Lord help you and I to look into our heart this morning. Before we utter just empty words, may we examine our lives and say, Lord, I confess I have not loved you from the bottom of my heart. It comes out as words. We'll say, Lord, I love you from the bottom of my heart. And that's not it. The Lord says he's not looking for those words. He's looking for a person with a humble heart, a contrite spirit, brokenness. You need to be found broken in worship, humbling yourself. The other day, just Danny and I were there in family prayer because everybody had gone to work and school. And for 25 minutes, the Lord in his spirit constrained me to worship him. And I said to him later, I, I couldn't tell that it, that much time passed because I was humbled in that attitude of worship. I didn't know that I spent that time. But when we looked at the clock later, the majority of my time was in worship. And I told him how Uncle Sudhir many times in this pulpit has shared. When he starts worshiping the Lord, the Lord gives him more and more and more and more revelation of how much he's worth and how unworthy I am and how we are. When we find ourselves in that state of brokenness and humbleness and contriteness, then the Lord will hear. He will hear your cry and he will hear your worship. So may the Lord help us this morning. And so we'll go into our time of worship.